Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. Word is still alive. Amen? Amen? We believe in His Word. Praise the Lord. It is still alive. Praise be to God. God began to lay this message on my heart as I was teaching Bible to the wonderful students of Praise Assembly of God Christian Academy. And I, and I told the guys, I said, guys, I was so moved Tuesday night in my prayer time that God began to lay the same passage of Scripture on to my heart to share for today's sermon. And so I told our students, I said, guys, you're getting an inside scoop, an inside scoop on how God just speaks and how he plans messages in, in a minister's heart. And, and so we've got to be obedient to the Lord. But last Sunday night, we learned how Elijah introduced God. Remember, he introduced God by the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And then God came forth and consumed you know, the in fire, that whole area, the altar, and all around the altar, and, and God proved himself to be the true God above the God of Baal. And, and so that was last Sunday night. And then, you know, when we got to, to, to the Bible class during the week, and I looked and I said, Lord, a, a great title of this morning's message is another introduction of Christ. Do you know, if you look in the Old Testament, you will find over 800 references to Jesus Christ. Prophetic references that came true. You will find over 800 uh, uh, forecoming verses of Jesus Christ in church. Uh, and you will also find where many of the prophets of God, whether it was Elijah to Amos to Daniel to David even, who obviously was the second king of Israel, you will find introductions to God to where God shows up. But church, we're going to look at the first introduction, actually the second next to the Christ child. You will find the second introduction of the Lord given by Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. Church, and I said last Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night, that we need some modern day Elijahs today. Remember that question I asked you, how many of you want to be a modern day Elijah? Praise the Lord. And the other question I have for you now is how many of you want to be a modern day John the Baptist is who is going to declare Jesus Christ. Well, the thing is about John the Baptist, his declaration was yes of reverence. His declaration was a prophetic being the voice in the wilderness. But we're also going to find out that in uh, uh, John the Baptist's introduction of Jesus, it was very much a challenge to the people. We're going to find to where John the Baptist is in his introduction of the one who, if you know the story of Jesus, of course he was born, and at two years old his parents had to take him to Egypt to escape from King Herod, and the decree for a baby boys two and younger to be killed, and then we know from Luke that Jesus was in his father's house teaching and praying, and uh, when Mary and Joseph could not find him, and then Jesus kind of goes absent for 18 years, as Jesus was preparing for the cross. And as he was preparing to come into, uh, into Israel to die. Well, church, we're going to find out that John the Baptist gives a great introduction of Jesus Christ. Last week, I spoke of the, the, the wrestling or the boxing illustration to where you have the announcer in the center of the ring. And then the wrestler or the boxer steps out of the curtain and walks down the ringside. Guess what, church? The announcer in today's case is John the Baptist, and Jesus Christ is about, is about to step out from behind the scenes and come onto the ring of life, which, of course, was the holy city of Jerusalem and Israel and the surrounding area of the Holy Land. But as Jesus is coming out, today, guys, our ring announcer shifts from Elijah to John. But the one coming out of the curtain is still the same. God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, is about to step out. And you know what, church? Guess what? In these last days, God the Father is going to be the ring announcer. And he's going to look back to God the Son. And he's going to say, Son, go get my children. I'm part in the eastern sky. 
The archangel's getting ready to blow the horn. And I'm calling you to come get my church without spot or wrinkle. Guess who that means? That means us, church. That means us. But here, today, we have another introduction of Jesus Christ. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's Word today. Stand, of course, if you're able. If you're not physically able, stand in your heart. We certainly understand that. Praise be to God. But those that are able, let's stand out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 3 today. And we're going to be looking at the first 12 verses. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruits of worthy, bear, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Church, again this week, we're going to get serious with God. We're going to get serious with his word, and we're going to get serious with this introduction of Jesus Christ. It would be shortly after the verses that I just read that Jesus Christ would come out onto the scene there at the Jordan River to want John the Baptist to baptize him. Those were the verses I read two months ago at our baptismal service when we had nine people baptized in water up in Roxbury. But here Jesus had yet to show himself. He was behind the scenes and John was given the introduction. Who was John's audience? If you remember from last week, Elijah's audience was the 450 prophets of Baal. It was all the Jewish people that King Ahab had called to the hill to, to, to test to see whose God is real. The God of Baal, the God of Elijah. Who is John the Baptist's audience? His audience is the believers that are the people there by the Jordan River as well as the Pharisees and Sadducees. His audience, too, were people wondering, who is God? Who is this real God? Maybe you asked yourself the question lately, who is God? Who is God really? Are you able to answer the question who God is? Are you able to answer the question who God is according to his word? Not what you think. Not what you've been told, not what you heard from Oprah Winfrey, not what you've heard from Jay Leno, but to be able to answer the question according to God's word itself. You know, do you know the question, who is God? Well, John the Baptist, he surely knew. And John the Baptist was kind of a crazy kind of fella. He was a different kind of guy. And we're going to talk about that here in just a few moments. But church, we have to understand first the audience in which John was speaking to. He was not speaking to a group of people wondering where Jesus was after 18 years of being absent. He was not speaking, you know, to a group of followers of Jesus Christ. He was speaking to an audience of people who had questions. Church, do you know that just this past week we've had 13 people come to know Christ? 
That means there are people in our community that want to know the question, who is this God? And they, they were given an invitation to receive Jesus Christ for who He is, the Son of the Almighty God. And 13 souls publicly gave their heart to Jesus Christ just this week. Praise the Lord. Think about that. 13 souls. 13 souls. Church, that's the business we're in. Lives being changed. Souls being saved. But church, when you stop and think, John the Baptist. His introduction was going to be a little different than that of Elijah's. His, his introduction was going to be a little different than that, you know, of Daniel to that of Jeremiah, you know, to the many other the great prophets of Scripture. His introduction was going to be a little different. His introduction was basically going to be centered around truth and the truth of repentance. Truth of turning from one's sin. Truth from turning from the wickedness of the heart and looking to the cross and looking to the life of Jesus Christ and what he would do. Church, as we break down these verses here this morning, it's important to know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. It's important to know that the kingdom of God is at hand and that Jesus Christ could very well return. The next horn to blow might not be Tim's blowing the horn. It may be the archangel blowing the horn and Jesus Christ returning. Are you ready to meet him? Yes. Not just when you're at church, but when you're at home in the secret place. Are you ready to meet him there? Young people, are you ready to meet Jesus when, you're, when your parents aren't looking and you're by yourself? Should that trump sound, would you be ready to meet him? How about it, adults? Are you ready, you know, spouses to meet the Lord? You know, when, when there's a problem at home or when you're not with your spouse or when you're at work or when you're home alone and you think nobody's watching, guess what? Jesus doesn't take a nap. He's watching. And the Bible says He's watching with His perfect eye. His eye is upon the sparrow, so it's surely upon me. Well, John the Baptist, says in his introduction, church, he wasn't playing no game. He wasn't playing around. He wasn't, you know, he was, yes, he was reverent, but he wasn't giving this great reverent introduction. Here, John the Baptist was giving an introduction that Jesus Christ, basically, church, whether you like it or not, was coming to prove himself to be the king, but also to come and to establish the standard of God, the measuring stick of God. <laughs> That God, you know, was, was shifting from the old covenant to the new. And that new covenant being the precious blood of Jesus Christ and not the blood of an animal. Church, as we break down these verses today, I pray that you'll, you'll, you'll begin to look at things from the perspective of John the Baptist and his audience 2,000 years ago. Because depending on who the audience is, sometimes you have to look at things from a different perspective. Think about it. Kid time. We sang kid songs. We did little cheers. We did little songs. The audience was different. I would not sit there and expect them to understand an expository sermon. But I do expect adults to, to be able to understand and teenagers to be in. I try to teach it as elementary as I can. But the audience is different. The audience is no longer a group of kids. The audience is adults and teenagers that are in this place right now, ready to hear a message from the Word of God. Here, John's audience was ready to hear, and they were highly upset with the instruction and the introduction that Jesus gave. Think about how shocked they were. Jesus had been absent from eight, for 18 years. The last thing we hear from him is from Luke chapter 2, when he rebukes his own parents. Because they could not find him. And he, Jesus said, I'm about my father's business. Where did you expect me to be? When he was in the house of God. Praying and teaching. That was the last we heard. Now we're hearing this Jesus thing again. You know, maybe it's been a long time for you since you've heard the gospel. Maybe it's been a long time for you since you really were at a right place with God. Maybe you're a believer here and you know you're not where you're supposed to be. And it's been a long time since you heard truly who Jesus Christ is according to Matthew chapter 3. Maybe it's been a long time since you've had the Holy Spirit's anointing upon your life. Maybe it's been a long time since your cup's been filled. And, and as you can see, my cup does not have a drop in it. And I looked over for water and there's not none there. That's all right. Maybe this is you today. Maybe your cup 
is not half, it's not half, but it's empty. There ain't a drop in that thing. I must have been thirsty Wednesday night. There is not a drop in this. It is empty. Okay? And so when you when you think about that, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're you're a believer, but your cup is dry. When the Bible says our cup should be running over, we should be, there should be livings of water coming out of us, and there's nothing there. Well, church. Jesus Christ is ready to fill you up just like he was ready to do 2,000 years ago. Let's break down these verses in verse 1 of chapter 3 of the book of Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He came preaching. You know, church, there's, a, there's, there's many folks today that believe there's no purpose or power in preaching anymore. I'm not one of those. I believe that preaching was good for the Old Testament and the New Testament and has been good in America for 240 years, why is it not good today? Je the Jesus is servant, the Apostle Paul said, how is an unbeliever supposed to hear? Thank you, brother. How is an unbeliever supposed to hear without the preached and anointed word of God? There's, some, there's power in preaching. Here, John the Baptist, he comes on the scene. He comes on the scene to bring power. He comes on the scene to bring preaching. And he is preaching in the wilderness or the desert place of Judea. And he came, and it's important to understand who John the Baptist is. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, and they're roughly the same age. They're very close in age. And the forerunner, the voice of the wilderness, you know, that was prophesied by Isaiah 800 years before, that there would be one who was going to come and introduce the Messiah. And if you know prophecy, you know that had not, that had not been done in Jesus' childhood years. It was just the prophecy of Micah, the prophecy of Isaiah as far as a virgin birth. And his name shall be called Emmanuel and he shall save people from their sin and, and all that kind of thing. That prophecy had been fulfilled, but this prophecy of the introduction of the forerunner, the voice in the wilderness had not been taking place. And here is John, Jesus' older cousin, just by a few short months, you know, comes on the scene. But he comes on the scene preaching. Wow. Think about that. John the Baptist was a preacher. John the Baptist was one, yes, that was unorthodox of that day, which we're going to read about here in a minute, but he came on the scene to preach. Why am I here today? I'm here to bring the Word of God. I tell people all the time, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, this past week has been a crazy week. I have worked five 16-hour days straight on the fumes. And I, I tell you what, though, church, I still believe 85% of what I do is preaching the Word of God. Whether it's to a crowd like this, whether it's in somebody's home, whether it's at Teen Challenge, wherever it might be teaching the kids during the week, is, is to preach the Word of God because that's what God has called me to do. And there's importance in preaching the Word. And I believe that's, that's primarily what my job is as pastor. You know, visitation's important, helping's important, all that kind of thing. But preaching is vital today for people to hear the good news. And here is John the Baptist coming on the scene in the wilderness of Judea. And he is doing what? He is preaching. He is preaching with the anointing. He is going to understand that he is the forerunner of, of Jesus Christ. He is the prophecy of Isaiah coming to light 800 years later. And church, I understand for such a time as this why God has called me. Do you understand why God has called you? Important to be able to answer that question. We talked about that last Saturday night at the 30th birthday celebration as Mordecai told Esther in Esther chapter 4, for such a time as this, you have been called. Well, church, the introduction is about to begin. The, the introduction is about to go forth. And church, think about this. Today, may we be found introducing the return of Jesus Christ. To where this River Valley community and all 10,000 people will say, you know what, Jesus, I've been expecting you. I, was, I learned the last 48, 72 hours that with 13 people coming to know Christ, is there are people in this community that have not heard the gospel. That God is sending us. I have learned if there was ever a time to preach the word, it's now. If there was ever a time to give an invitation, it is now. Somebody asked me again Thursday at community lunch. Pastor, are you going to give an invitation today? I said, is the sun shining? Yep. Yeah. And aren't you glad four people come to know Christ? Praise be to God. And they're all up in this place right now. Coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. Well, church, here's, here's, here's John. 
Here is John that is that is that is preaching the word. And here in verse number two, and what's he preaching? And saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Think about this, church. Think about this so, so very much. Repent. And he's saying repent, which means to turn away from. Church, so many times where people say, well, I, I came to Christ. Well, church, if you truly come to Christ, and that's what confession is all about, and that's what admission is all about, you turn from that sin not to be bothered from it anymore. To so turn away. Don't just participate in it. Well, I got Jesus. That doesn't give you a license to do whatever you want to do. I remember when my parents uh, allowed me to go to driver's ed and allowed me to uh, get a license, allowed me to drive their car for three weeks until I bought Old Faithful when I was 16 years old. You know, and let me tell you, my father said justice does not give you permission to do whatever you want. And he also said if you get bad grades, that license is coming back to me. And he also said if you get bad grades, you ain't driving my car. And he also said, you're under 18 years old, so if you go to buy a car, i got to put my John Hancock on there. <laughs> All right? And so it did not give me a license to do whatever I want to do. And see, church, sometimes we think, well, I gave my heart to Christ. That doesn't give you a license to do whatever you want to do. You've got to come with a repentant heart and turn from that. Turn from those lying lips. Turn from that abusive tongue. Turn from that, you know, that hatred that's in your heart. Turn from that, you know, brokenness and pain and addiction and hurt and whatever's on the other side. And repent and come back to Jesus Christ, and to truly worship Him with all of your hearts. Here John the Baptist said, hey, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's the first part of the introduction? The kingdom of heaven. Who is the kingdom of heaven? Jesus Christ is ushering in. Wow. Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Wow. Who's the gatekeeper to His kingdom? Jesus Christ. You're not sneaking in the back door. This isn't the Mexican border, you know, where it's open policy and you can just climb over a fence. That ain't happening. There's not a little, a little river that you can just swim through. Jesus Christ is the gatekeeper and there ain't no way you're getting around it. Jesus tells us that later on in the book of John. He is the good shepherd. He is the gatekeeper. He's watching over that door. And you can't go under it. You can't go over it. You can't go through it. And here, church, he says, John the Baptist declares to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That kingdom of heaven is Jesus Christ. That kingdom, the, the root word of, you know, or if you look at kingdom, you can easily see the word, you know, key. You can think of the word key. Jesus holds the key to heaven. And church, when you, when you think about this, Jesus Christ was about to usher in heaven. Church, do you know that this is a taste of heaven today as we're found worshiping the Lord. And as Jesus Christ comes on the scene, we learned last month that the Father is going to reveal the Son to this lost and dying world. He's going to reveal it here today too. Give you an opportunity to come to know Christ today if you don't know him. For Jesus to take your sin and throw it into the sea of forgetfulness to never be remembered again. You can be as white as dot sweater right there if you come to know Jesus Christ today. To where your sin is forgiven you. And when Jesus throws something into the sea of forgetfulness, he's not like us and bring it back up over and over and over and over again. Jesus forgets it because he's washed it away. He don't come back and back when we, back when we first were in love. He said this to me. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus, if you will, has a bad memory. He said, you know what? I forgot that. I moved that on. I took that on the cross. You said sorry, and I threw it to the sea of forgetfulness. When Jesus sees us, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and he sees that true repentance and we turn from that sin, and we're made as white as snow, just as if we had never committed the sin, we are pardoned. And here is John the Baptist telling his audience to repent. Pretend you were sitting in the audience. That would be, I don't feel too good. Maybe right now you're not feeling too good. Church, we're not Burger King. We can't have it our way. We got, we got to do it the way of God. It doesn't work that way. I want this and I want that. And if I don't get it that way, I'll take it back and get a free burger. No, that's not happening. Here's the instruction and repentance is the key. John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ is coming in. Heaven has come to this world. How did heaven come to this world through Jesus Christ? Wow. How is heaven still coming to this world? Through teaching of Jesus Christ through his precious Holy Spirit that comes forth and as God is upon us. And we sang about that earlier. Welcome Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And where it means is at hand means it's in the present. It is here, church. It is here. Live and in color. It is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. I believe fully that God is in this place right now. Amen. And guess what, church? We're his guest. This is his house. We've given responsibility to be steward of it, but this is his house. And we're in his presence. 
And we're coming before him. And you know what God's saying? You know what? I love you. I, I'm going to extend grace and mercy to you. But you have to turn from your sin and believe on Jesus Christ this morning. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We're not Burger King. Have it your way. That's not how it works. We're at work. God, it's your way. God, it's you. This is about you. This isn't about other things. I think too many times we're given a watered down gospel. And many people think they're serving Christ. But all they're doing is ser serving in a glorified fashion the world. And who's the father of the world? Who's the father of lies? The adversary themselves. Church repentance is huge. John the Baptist, as he's introducing Jesus, was right. He was serious with the audience saying basically repent. Turn from your sin. He had seen that they had fallen away greatly. Verse number 3. For this is he who has spoken by prophet Isaiah saying... So when you look at this church, you see that John the Baptist declares he is the prophetic voice. He is the one that Isaiah had declared 800 years prior to that there would be a forerunner to Jesus Christ. Do you know that there's a forerunner to the Antichrist? It's the false prophet. The book of Revelation tells us. Daniel tells us there's going to be a forerunner. The Antichrist, he's, and Satan is such a great counterfeit. Church, we live in a counterfeit world today. But church, if we have the word and we know the word, we can have the truth. How does the Department of Treasury tell what's counterfeit? They don't study all the different counterfeit bills out there. They just simply study the real thing. We can study the real thing too. What's the real thing? The same thing I told the kids, the Bible. The Bible, the real deal, the word of God. Say, Pastor, I'm not a good reader. Well, go to BibleGateway.com and listen to God's word. Let God's word just minister to you. And most people have the internet today. If that's a problem, see me and I'll be glad to meet with you and go over the Bible with you verse by verse. I was down at the nursing home yesterday doing a men's Bible study. You know, and just folks, two of the guys were illiterate. I'm just reading the word of God to them. If you need that help, I'll be glad to help you and I know others will too. And so church here, John the Baptist, as he is preaching, he is saying, hey, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. What was John the Baptist in his introduction? The next piece was, hey, prepare the way. Here comes the Lord. Prepare the way, and the Lord's ways are straight. Church, the Lord's not the author of confusion. He's not calling one thing good today and one thing evil today, and the next day flip it back and forth. That's not how the Lord works. His paths are straight. It's, it's the straight and narrow that we're to be walking, not this broad path that goes all over the place. It's the straight path. And then God told Peter, be holy for I am holy. So that path is so, so vitally important. And John the Baptist is saying, hey, prepare the way. Prepare the way because the Lord, you better get straightened up, folks, because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is on the scene. And you better believe those in the crowd were, were starting to stir in their seats. They were not too happy. Many of them. Many of them, however, would turn to Christ. Would turn to and listen to the. And many would be baptized there at the Jordan. But church, when you look at this. For this was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Crying in the King James meant to Lament. Which John the Baptist was crying over souls. He was the one urging people, begging people, imploring people to come to the foot of the cross. And to believe in the Messiah. To believe in the one who could take away their sin. Because Jesus was not taking a fork in the road. Geometry class. Which by the way, I like teaching math. Not as much as history. But I learned this teaching geometry as well when I was a teacher as well as as a student years ago. Was the shortest distance between two points. Is a straight line. Church, Jesus Christ, he's going from point to point. And his next point is his second coming. Or the, the rapture of the church is going to usher that in. His last point was his ascension. And church, but when Jesus came 2,000 years ago, his points were basically from this point, which John is talking about, to the cross. There was no forks in the road. There was no, I'll go over here, I'll change my mind over here. His paths were straight. And church, Jesus... Declare, the Bible declares in Hebrews that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His paths. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Which basically, John was saying, hey, get straight, guys. Jesus Christ is coming down to ringside. He's coming down to the Jordan. So you guys got to straighten up, straight line, just like this aisle right here is, is a straight line. Okay, there's nothing blocking that. People come right down the aisle. Okay, Jesus Christ is coming in. Make your path straight. 
Get your feet out of the aisle. Okay, get your feet out of the aisle because the voice, Jesus Christ, is coming prepared. Church, are you prepared for Jesus Christ to come into your heart? You're here today. You're going to get an invitation to receive Christ. Are you preparing believers for Jesus Christ to return? Think about it. How often is your hand in a cookie jar? And think, wow, I hope Jesus didn't hear that. I hope he, I'm glad he didn't come then or I'd be in serious trouble. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, the parable of the faithful and evil servant, be careful you never know when the master may come on the scene. Be ready. Don't be like the lazy man. Oh, pastor, what are you doing here? I didn't expect you till next week. Be ready. Prepare the way. His paths. Make, make his paths straight. Verse number four, we look at how John was kind of unorthodox. He was an unorthodox person. Nothing like Jesus, his younger cousin. He was an unorthodox person. Now, John himself was clothed in camel's hair. I remember when Mary and I, when we, we were at General Council in Washington, D.C., August the 5th to the 7th, three days before we came to Maine to candidate for the pastorate here of Praise Assembly. This was in the year of 2003. And the opening to General Council was just this wild man. Camel's hair. You know, the, he would, we clear, I knew right away he's, he's portraying John the Baptist. And he gets out and he quotes the verses that we're looking at right now. For the people there to repent. And then our general superintendent at the time, Brother Trask, walked out and said, Guess what, guys? Before you can go out and share the gospel to the community which you're from, you've got to know Jesus yourself. And they gave an altar call right there. And pastors coming up to go to Christ. And we were in the Verizon Center where the Washington Wizards play, where the Washington Capitals play. We were in that arena. And there were about 10,000 pastors there and many of them coming to know Christ. Because of this, this right here, John the Baptist. But I'll never forget that guy's character. John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. The only one that I can even vaguely compare this description to is, of course, to Esau, Jacob's twin brother, Isaac's older son, okay, who, 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 robbed his, who was robbed of his birthright by Jacob. And many of you know that story. But church, here we see a wild man. But guess what? It doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're a hillbilly or if you're a southern boy like myself or if you're a city slicker. It doesn't matter if, you know, if you like sports or if you like horses. It doesn't matter, church. The gospel is the gospel, and we all need to be found preparing the way for Jesus Christ to return. Amen. Every believer in here needs to be found declaring the way. Now, of course, here some people say, what kind of wild man is this? It's Jesus' cousin. But more specifically, it's the forerunner that the prophet Isaiah talk, talked about. Church, we don't have the... Some people say he can't be, just like they say about Jesus being born in a manger. That possibly can't be the Messiah. This possibly can't be the forerunner because there's no way that King Jesus would have a mountain man as the forerunner. Who are you to say that? Who do you think you are? Who do I think I am? We don't have the authority to say We have to believe because this is the word of God and that Jesus did come. John gave the introduction and Jesus walked out. And his first act was to be baptized by John the Baptist. Who humbled, who, who Jesus told to humble himself. So that all righteousness could be fulfilled. And so church, it's, it's important not to get caught up in, like, like for example, and when I came to Maine, there were many people who did not want to come to our church because of my age. There were many people who, well, we're mainers, we're independent people, we're, we're, we're direct people, and, and your pastor talks with a southern accent. And I still do. I can't get, I, I'm a Marylander. You know, it's not going to change, most likely. I still talk with the draw. I still say y'all. You know, I still root for the birds, praise the Lord. All right? And so, they, that's where my roots are. Well, church, we don't have the, if someone comes here... And, 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 and comes and brings the word, or maybe it's you, maybe you're, maybe you're a little, uh, you like the outdoors, or maybe you don't have the best grammar in the world. Church, the Bible says that the gospel is easy enough even for a child to understand. So don't get caught up in this, well this takes away the credibility of John the Baptist as the forerunner. Church, this is a great introduction. Do you know God loves to use ordinary people? He used a tax collector. He used fishermen. You know, Jesus had a lot of different different groups of, of, of background with him as part of the 12 uh, disciples. He called little Zacchaeus, little short Zacchaeus, out of a tree. 
You know, Jesus used a physician by the name of Luke. Jesus had a lot of great people. You know, uh, Jesus used Judas, who was a treasurer, good with money. What we would call today an accountant. But church, it's important to understand not to get caught up in what someone looks like. Get caught up in what they're saying. And church, today I'm saying to you, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus Christ is coming soon. And tomorrow might not come. You may somebody say, well, pastor, you know, all this church has been a lot of people that have sat in these chairs one day and we're going the next. I get the call. Pastor so-and-so took their life. Pastor so-and-so hit a tree. Pastor so-and-so uh, succumbed to a disease that nobody even knew they had. Don't think you got all... Don't, young people, do not think you have all the time in the world. Don't fall for that mistake. Oh, sow your oats and just have a good old time. And then when you turn 25, you know, didn't, didn't get serious. Or now it's 30, then get serious. Don't fall for that trap. You might not see that. Come to know Christ today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Give him the best years of your life. When you have less personal responsibility, but you have far greater health when you're a teenager and you're a young adult than, you, when, you, than when you will later on in life. Verse number five, that Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan River went out to him. John was getting attention. People were coming from all over the place to the Jordan. Do you know that the gospel is for everybody? It's not for the white man. I love the children's song. My mother sang this one morning about red, yellow, black, and white. We're all precious in his sight. That's, how, that's the song she sang probably more than any other song. She did not want any bit of the racism that came from my grandparents' generation and some of those uh, relatives of mine at all, to, that she wanted that to die out and she wanted us to know as kids that Jesus went to the cross for every race, every ethnicity, every language, is that Jesus died. And a matter of fact, Jesus wasn't white either. By the way, he was olive-skinned. He was a Jew. So, so Jesus, he died for both Jew and Gentile. And here all the people of Israel are coming down to the Jordan. They're wanting to hear. Do you know what? I think God's going to fill this place. Look around. You know, if, you, if we bring the children back in here from downstairs and out in the back, we fill. We come right on around here. We come right. Think about this. This is great. I can't wait. we got folks over in that way. I'm going to look all the way around. You know, God's going to send people here to hear his word. Here at the Jordan River, God was sending everybody to hear what John had to say as he was introducing the Messiah. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People coming from all over. Church, we got sometimes 50 plus people in here on a Sunday night. Friday night we had a lot of people here. Thursday we had a lot of people here. I'm praying that God's going to raise up our kids at the school to where God's going to fill this place on Friday afternoons with men and women and other, other students to come here. Our young people worship the Lord and bring a word that they will come and this community will come to know Jesus Christ. But church, when you, you look at it, they all coming around, they went out to John. And many were baptized by him in the Jordan, going what? Confessing their sins. They were understanding. They were listening. Church, we're seeing that here. Last, last, month, or, yeah, last month in August, we had three kids come to know Christ. This week, we've had 13 people come to know Christ. In the month of July, we had seven come to know Christ. Five of those got baptized in water. People were confessing their sin. They were realizing that they were not walking with God. They were realizing they were liars and deceivers and cheaters. Not, not, not respecting voices of authority. Commit, committing idolatry toward God. They were there at the Jordan and they were confessing their sin. And today you get an opportunity to do that. So that you can spend eternity in heaven. So that you can walk with God. And know that should Jesus return... Should the rapture take place, or should you die, you're going to have a place in heaven. Jesus declares, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And there's a mansion with your name on it. If you put your faith. Think about it. You're an heir of Jesus Christ if you know him. Oh, I pray all 10,000 people will know Christ. I was talking to the, the gas attendant there at the Big Apple last night. He said, Pastor, I listen to you every week. And I said, man, you've got to come to church. I will once football season's over. That's what he told me. <laughs> That's what he told me. <coughs> football. Oh, football. Football just drives so many people. All right, but I said, I'm going to keep coming in here. And the football ends. I said, football ends February 3rd, 2015. And I want you in here February 10th. Uh, he said, all right, Pastor, I'll do it. I said, good. I'm going to check you out. Football, football, football. Football, football, football. 
Wouldn't that be great for Jesus to return right in the middle of the Super Bowl? <laughs> that would be good. Wow. Football, football, football. But then he says this. Verse number 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, the religious leaders come on the scene. Do you ever wonder if you watch Billy Graham, which I did, even when I was an unbeliever, I was always fascinated with how he preached. And you may notice there's a little Billy Graham flavor at every invitation I give. But, but, the, but I remember thinking, I remember talking to Dad and I said, Dad, why does he always turn around and say you might be members of the choir? And then why does he point out like this and say you might be a pastor here or you might be a deacon here, but you don't know Christ? Because now I understand, Billy Graham understood and understands because he's still alive, praise the Lord, be 96 years old next month, and not, or the first week of November. And, and, and he understood the difference between walking with Christ and having a relationship with him and just participating in religion. Maybe all you have today is religion. Well, Jesus Christ came to bring you life. Life more abundantly. And to think you can have a re personal relationship with the God of this universe. And here come the religious guys on the scene. And John the Baptist saw them. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, he didn't say to them, welcome, here's a front row seat. You know, you're a pastor, you're a religious leader, come sit up here. He called them a brood of vipers. A brood of snakes. A viper is a snake. Think about that. How did the adversary come into the, you know, as a, as a serpent, but many children's books and Bibles, you see him as a snake, you know, there, tempting Eve. He called them a brood of vipers. Wow. Think about this. A brood of snakes. You know, Jesus later on would call the same characters that he called a brood of vipers, called them sons of the devil. Wow. And these are the religious folks that are down there. John saw, you know, in his introduction of Jesus Christ, that the ones that needed to make their path straight are the ones that were supposedly walking closest to God as his representative. And now I fully understand why Billy Graham did what he did. Because he saw lukewarm Christianity. He saw religion rather than a relationship. Okay? And here, you know, John the Baptist calls them brood of vipers. And then he declares, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come. Wow! The next part of the introduction is that there is wrath coming with Jesus Christ. You know, the first time Jesus came, he came to die. The second time, he's coming to judge. Look in that mirror. What do you see? I'm not talking about a hair out of place. I'm talking about a heart that needs to be transplanted from good, from evil to good. And to change and let God change you. Here, John the Baptist, people say, were the Pharisees and Sadducees warned before Jesus called them sons of the devil? Oh yes, John the Baptist warned them way back at his introduction when Jesus Christ came onto the scene at the Jordan River. Oh yes, they were warned. The book of Amos tells us that, that God will not bring judgment until he first reveals his secrets to his prophets first. Which means a warning is going to come. A warning. Before I bring discipline to any of, of my students, I always warn them. Let them know, hey, the next time's the detention. The next time, hey, you're having lunch with me. This behavior is not going to be accepted in this classroom. And I give them a warning and they usually respond. But church, it's important to understand that John did give the Pharisees and Sadducees a warning that there was going to be wrath to come. And he wasn't just speaking of, of that generation. He was speaking of the second coming of Christ, which was prophesied in the Old Testament by every one of the prophets, from King David all the way to Malachi. Every one of them promised about the judgment seat of Christ. And, and even uh, uh, Daniel spoke of the great white grown judgment where unbelievers would be judged for their lack of faith in the Messiah. But church, here we have uh, uh, John the Baptist getting very serious in his introduction. Verse number 8. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Basically he didn't just say. Okay guys your goose is cooked. He told them repent. There's still time for you. Do you know guys there's still time for you today. Do you know in the assemblies of God. We get a minister's card. And on the back of this card.
got a new wallet. <laughs> there it is. Forgot where I put it. Janet helps me out every year by putting, uh, lam what is it called, Janet? Help me out. Laminating. Laminating. So I don't bend it. And this is my minister's card, but on the back of it, it has a crisis number. And the latest numbers that came out spoke of where 80% of pastors use the crisis number because of moral failure and because of doubt and because of other issues that they get themselves into. Church, if there was ever a time that we need to pray for even pastors who are in the pulpits for the Lord, it is now to repent of their sin and turn back to God. And here, John the Baptist, he wasn't just wiping them out, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. He was giving them an opportunity, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Church, I instruct you to do the same, bear fruits worthy of repentance. If Jesus Christ is in your heart, there should be change taking place. You should not be the same person over and over and over again. You should have a closer walk with God every day. Every step of the way, growing and maturing. You know nobody here is perfect. Not a single one of us. Even if you know Jesus Christ, you're still not perfect. You're going to have to there's still bear fruits worthy of repentance. What's he saying there? He's saying there, if you're truly sorrowful for what you've done, people are going to see that changed heart. You're not going to be living in 1995 when Bill Clinton was president. You're not going to be living, you know, in yesteryear. You're not going to be living and, and bringing up all this old baggage in, in someone else's life. You're going to live with fruits worthy of repentance. You have changed. Young people, just because you have a reputation this way doesn't mean you have to have that your whole life. You can turn from that. And, you can, and people can see that there is fruit worthy of repentance. I pray, guys, that you, five years from now, should the Lord tarry, that people could testify, wow, what a changed person you are. You know, it did my heart good last week in men's group where two men spoke of the change that they've seen in the lives of our young men. Wow. We heard just a couple weeks ago one wife testify about how her husband has changed. What does that mean? That means bearing fruit worthy of repentance. They turn from that. They turn from that old self. And, and the F-bombs are no longer in the vocabulary. God's still working on some things, but some things are changing. I'm respected. I no longer uh, have to worry. I can leave my kids home, whatever it might be, where there's fruit worthy of repentance. Verse number 9, and think to say to yourselves. So here, John the Baptist would do exactly what Jesus would do a lot of times, look into the heart. Basically saying, hey, don't think to yourselves. Well, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Here, church, you know it. What John the Baptist is saying as he is introducing Jesus, he knows what the opposition is going to say and think as they try to justify their place in life, as they try to justify their religion. Well, I had a bad childhood. Guess what, church? Jesus has come to redeem you of that broken childhood. So it's time you start stop living in the 60s and come out of that and be who God wants you to be. I hear that all the time. Well, I got mental illness. I got a broken child. You know what? Jesus went to the cross to set you free of that. Come on, church. Think about it. You can't keep it. Because all that does is give the adversary fuel. That's all that does. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are an heir of Jesus Christ. You are not that same person anymore. And here, so, so here, John the Baptist, he knew what, what the Pharisees and Sadducees would say. They would go back to their heritage and go all the way back to Abraham. Church, that's what I used to do. When I, wasn't, when I was running from God and wasn't saved, you know, I left the church at 13, came, praise God, got truly saved at 19 years old. But I used to tell people from 13 to 19, well, my dad's a deacon. I'd go back to what the only part I knew and the only part, the only faith that I saw. Church, that wasn't getting me into heaven. That wasn't repentance. That wasn't bearing fruit worthy of repentance. That was just justifying my place. That was just religion in my life. Everybody in here can know Jesus Christ personally. Every single person can know Jesus Christ personally today. Here John, here John the Baptist, he wasn't buying that when he was introducing Jesus. You know, he wasn't buying what they were coming up with. You know, God can, God can do anything. He can raise up a stone, bring, bring life to a stone. Jesus, God can do anything. Jesus is going to be able to perform all miracles. Think about it, Jesus. He did everything. Because he's God. 
Verse number 10, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. And so what did John do here? He, bring, he brought the introduction to the present and said, hey, guess what? The trees that are here, Jesus is coming, and he's coming with an axe. And the tree is your heart. The tree was the heart of the Pharisees and Sadducees and everybody else down by the Jordan River. In John the Baptist's introduction, he was, he was calling a spade a spade. Church, the gospel's not meant to be watered down. It's meant to be taken serious. We, we, we can't change the gospel just to make you feel good. Feeling good is not what it's about, church. Truth is what it's about. Feeling good is not going to produce fruits worthy of repentance. Jesus didn't come bringing a feel-good gospel. He'd say, hey, go and sin no more. He looked into the heart. He said, what are you doing? Revelation, lukewarm Christianity, I'm going to spew that out. He looked in, you know, he was very serious about what he was doing. He wasn't interested in making the woman at the well of John 4 feel good. He told her, hey, you've been, you've been married five times and living with another man who's not your husband. He looked at the sin and wanted them to turn. And those that did, Jesus would forgive. Jesus will forgive you today too. But he will tell you if it's true faith, if it's true repentance, go and sin no more. Pluck out the eye that's causing you to sin. Cut off the hand, figuratively speaking, of course. TV's causing you to sin, get rid of it. Credit card causing you to sin, cut that thing up. You know, if there's sin in your life, you're addicted to something, bring it up here to the altar. We'll be glad to get rid of it. A couple weeks ago, we had three bottles of pills here and an instrument used for self-mutilating here at this altar, Sunday night. Pastor Davis, he's sure he's getting quiet. That's what God's talking about. So that you set free. I'll be glad to get a pair of scissors and cut up a credit card if you're in bondage to that. We'll be glad to take drug paraphernalia. Be glad to take pills out of a purse. Be glad, you know, to take, you know, whatever it might be and say, you know, Jesus is speaking to my heart and it begins now. I'm making my path straight because the Lord is walking in my life now. And he will forgive you. He will forgive you. He, don't just buy this, but he'll give you enough strength to carry it. Yeah, he will. But church, God didn't come just so you can survive. He came so that you can thrive. Amen. Bring you life. Amen. And life more abundantly. That's right. That's right. But he says here, John the Baptist, he says, you know, and even now the axe is laid to the roots of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Who's the one doing all this? Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming down to the ring. And he's coming with an axe in his hand. Remember wrestling in the 80s? I grew up on wrestling. Some of you did too. My favorite wrestler, the greatest intercontinental champ of all time, the Honky Tonk Man. Remember him? Elvis impersonator. He'd come to the ring with a guitar. And he'd wrap that around some people's heads too. It was a stage guitar, just so you know. But he came to the ring with a guitar. Jesus is coming to the ring, and he's coming with an axe. And he's, he's interested in cutting down some trees. Guess what? We're the trees. The question is, are we a good tree or a bad tree? Jesus is going to cut down the bad tree and say, hey, got to get rid of that. What can make you good today? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Here, church, it's important to understand John the Baptist was not watering down anything. He was getting real serious with the people. He was getting real serious with the people, including the Pharisees and Sadducees. And verse number 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he, referring to Jesus Christ, who is coming after me, is mightier than I. I'm getting off the stage, and Jesus Christ is getting on the stage. What happens with that ring announcer? He leaves the ring. Who stays in the ring? The two wrestlers or the two boxers, they stay in the ring, and the ring announcer goes out and sits down. All right, John the Baptist, he's stepping outside of the ring, and Jesus Christ is in the ring. Who's left with Jesus? We are. We are. We're left in the ring. Here John the Baptist has said, hey, one is coming greater than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, and that Jesus, he will baptize you with Holy Ghost and fire. Wow, we just think about the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost and fire. He's, he's not just coming to cut down trees, but he's coming down to baptize those that want to follow after him. <coughs> I don't know about you, but I want the power today so I can leave in a, live in an evil world. 
I want the power of God behind me. I don't want just enough to get by. I want enough to where I'm going to thrive in my walk with the Lord and, and share the gospel with this lost and dying world, to have a peace that passes all understanding, to be able to sleep at night, you know, to be able to, to know where I'm supposed to be with God. Here, John the Baptist is taking the attention from him, and he's saying, he's coming right after me. I'm leaving the stage, and Jesus Christ is coming into the ring. Matter of fact, John the Baptist really wouldn't have time to get off the stage, and then Jesus said, hey, John, come baptize me. If you continue reading in Matthew 3, John didn't have time to leave the stage. And then he wanted to leave the stage. He wanted to get out. Jesus said, no, you will baptize me now to fulfill the righteousness of my word. And then John, John said, let it be so. Wow, think about that. John was, a humble, John was a humble man in his introduction. But he was bringing truth. In church here today, I'm bringing truth to you today. Do you, do you know Christ? Are you ready to be baptized by Holy Ghost and fire? Verse number 12. His winnowing fan is in his hand. Meaning, he is going to clean as he goes. He is going to judge as he goes. Do you know Jesus judged the soul of the man on the thief on the cross? Jesus judged him right there as he was hanging beside Jesus and dying. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, with me you will be in paradise. People say, did Jesus judge? Oh yeah, he judged on this earth. He sure did. And he told the thief, you're going to be with me in paradise. And here Jesus has, has the winnowing fan in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. And here Jesus Christ. Church, do you know to get to heaven, it's going to be righteous? There ain't going to be no jokers there. Why? Because the Lord is cleaning things up. I remember when I worked at the crab house. When I was a teenager and I made good money. I loved working there. But I tell you what, I was not the best dishwasher. Because I didn't want to take time to do it by hand. I'd move too fast. And they'd say, Justin, these forks aren't clean. I said, yeah, I know, but I was moving fast. And it was time to get busy and I wasn't doing the best. And I'd miss a spot or two. Guess what? The Lord's not missing a spot. When you get to heaven, you better believe it's righteous. Nobody's sneaking in, church. You ain't getting there because of somebody else's faith. Well, I live with somebody that's a believer. Is that going to be okay? I do a lot of good things. I put a few 20s in the bag. Church, you can put a few hundreds in the bag, a few thousands in the bag, but that ain't getting you to heaven. You can live, you, can live, you know, with Billy Graham himself. But you ain't getting to heaven if Christ ain't in your heart. And here Jesus Christ, and, and his, he is moving forth, and he is... He is, he, is going to, uh, he is going to move thoroughly with a clean hand and clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. Church, I want to be his wheat. Do you? I want to be his wheat. I want to be gathered in the barn. I want to be part of the fruits. I want, my, I want to walk with God and, and for him to say one day, well done, good and faithful servants. But he will, he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft or the waste with unquenchable fire. Wow, John the Baptist, as he closes out as an intro before Jesus comes on the scene as a 30-year-old adult, he's saying, you guess what? I'm taking care of the good, and I'm getting rid of the bad. Why would Jesus do this? Because he cannot tolerate sin. Sin separates us from God. And John the Baptist knew it when he was introducing Jesus Christ. And you know what? Not only does John the Baptist know it, but you know it now. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Young people, what are you going to do with it? A lot of young people in here right now. What are you going to do with it? I see young people all around this place. What are you going to do with it, young people? You understand this. Adults, what about you? What are you going to do with this introduction to Jesus? You're going to say, Pastor, I don't agree with that. It's the Bible. Then you say you don't agree with the Bible. Is that your argument? Okay. Seniors, what about you? A lot of seniors in here today. Praise God for seniors. The gospel's for all of us. Say, Pastor, I realize now I need, to, I, need to, I need to get right with God. Well, here's how you do it. The first part is an invitation. We all love to get a, give an invitation to a wedding or a birthday party or a baby shower. I still can't believe I'm going to be the recipient of the one giving out a baby shower. That's amazing. <laughs> but you're going to get an invitation. 
And guess what? This invitation is going to have your name on it. And it's going to be spelled correctly. It's going to have your name and it's going to be given to you right now. And the Father's will is that none should perish, but all will come to everlasting life. And he's given, him, given you an invitation right now to receive this life. And the invitation is from the Father revealing his Son to you today. And on that invitation, the first part is to admit that you're a sinner. Just like on the first part of a wedding invitation, it comes from the parents. Where I remember ours said, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Curtis, Otis Thacker, and Mr. and Mrs. William Cackadin proudly announced. That's what our invitation said. And here's the first part of your invitation from God, is admit that you're a sinner. And repent from that sin, that you've broken every one of the Ten Commandments, and therefore you need a Savior. And what can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood. And how do you get the blood of Jesus Christ through your life? It's by repenting and turning from your sin, and admitting, therefore, you need forgiveness. And then the, then, the, then the third part of the invitation, as you go down to the date, Mary and I got married December 29th, 1999. You know, I remember it 6 p.m. at night. I remember it like it was yesterday. Here's the third part of the invitation is to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. And that he took it all. He bled from the top of his head to the tips of his toes for you and for me. And then we also have to believe that he rose again the third day. He rose again, proving to be the Messiah. Proving to be the one who was the Alpha and Omega. And then the fourth part of the invitation is to confess. The fourth part of the invitation is to confess, you know, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the Bible says that if we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, that you can be saved. And, and, and Luke writes in Acts that whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And by confessing, basically what you're doing is saying, you know what, my life belongs to God. I'm tired of the garbage. I'm tired of the old self. My life now belongs to God. He died for me, so I'm going to live for him. And that's kind of like in the invitation where it has all the groomsmen names, all the bridesmaids, you know, and all those in the wedding party. And then you get to the last part of the invitation, which is the food of a wedding invitation. Where you got to check, do you want the chicken, do you want the fish, do you want, you know, whatever you want there, you check the box and then they bring it out to you. Unless at our wedding, all we had was subs from, from uh, Food Line. Everybody got the same thing, but that wasn't the original plan. But here, here we go. Here we go. The last part of the invitation is to step out publicly and receive Jesus Christ. Right now, if I said, Chris, bring me over that flat screen TV as a prize. And if I said to you, look under your seat. And if you've got a green dot under your seat, that TV is yours. You guys would all be looking. If you had a green dot, you'd be up here real quick to receive that 32-inch flat screen TV that's coming up here shortly. We'd have no problem stepping out publicly to receive a gift. Well, guess what? Why don't we step out publicly and receive the greatest gift ever? And that is Jesus Christ. Jesus said if you're willing to confess him publicly before man, he will confess you before our Father in heaven. However... Hello, thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services, Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m., worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well, we have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.